Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul Johnson. I'm the, the Vice Chancellor here. Um, uh, I just want to say, say a couple of things about what's going to happen next. We could not um, let slip the opportunity of having one of uh, the most distinguished of, of international jurists and one of Australia's um, great public intellectuals coming to the university and then slipping away before we'd heard a little bit more from him. And uh, it seemed to me to be um, uh, uh, appropriate to the uh, history of La Trobe University that was, of course, established uh, back in 1964 to be a, a radical and progressive university that we should have, uh, that we should set up a conversation, a conversation of Michael Kirby, student activist and radical from some time ago, with Dennis Altman, Professor Dennis Altman, another student activist and radical uh, from some time ago. And this is part of uh, a, a program, the Ideas and Society program here at La Trobe University, um, convened by Professor Robert Mann, uh, where we try to bring in people uh, to the university to discuss some of the issues of the day. The reason that the cameras are here is that um, we have found that the audience for these uh, discussions and conversations uh, uh, is enormously expanded by um, recording these conversations, putting them out on the web on iTunes U, uh, and we then um, give the opportunity to many thousands of people, students and others around the world, uh, to uh, enjoy and reflect on the, these conversations. So uh, we will now turn to two troublemakers from the past to see if they can make some more trouble. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Um, when I was asked to have a conversation in public with Michael, I, th I thought we would generally range over topics of law, politics, and sex. But I should begin by saying that my initial memories of you, Michael, would not have seen you as in any way a radical. Um, and my initial memories of you go back to when I was a very young and innocent student politician from the University of Tasmania and Australian national student politics were dominated by two very major figures, yourself and Peter Walensky. And I can remember the awe and trembling with which I went to my first national student meeting um, and encountered essentially two legends at the time. And I guess I'm, I'm curious, because at that stage I think we would have seen you as clearly a future leader. I'm curious why you chose the path you did, why law rather than politics? Well, first of all, um, uh, I agree with what you say about Peter Walensky. He was a very forward-looking thinker, much more forward-looking than I was. He saw the issues of white Australia before I did. He saw the issues of women's rights and equality before I did. Uh, he uh, was very strongly uh, concerned about Aboriginal rights and was engaged with them. He was just one of those people who peered into the future and saw things which others didn't see. We had to have the scales lifted from our eyes. Now, uh, myself, I was long way behind Peter. There were other people at the time or soon afterwards Gareth Evans was the president of the Melbourne SRC a couple of years later. Uh, Darrell uh, Williams, who became Federal Attorney General, was the, from the Guild, We of the West, he kept talking about. Uh, John Bannon, who became Premier of, uh, of South Australia, was, was there. And virtually uh, all of them, were, and, and I continue to see them in honours lists and in other worthy co uh, connections, they were really amazing people, um, and some of them were even women. There were some women student politicians battering against the prejudice and inequalities of that time. But um, if I appeared conservative, then it was because I had reached a view early in those years that the way for a person of a liberal disposition, I hesitate to say radical now, a liberal disposition was to look very safe. In short, to look as close as you possibly could, like Mr Menzies. Uh, <laughs> to have a double-breasted suit, 
uh, to wear a very uh, dark uh, and um, respectable ties, and that way uh, people would trust you completely and you could get away with all sorts of things you couldn't get away with if you were dressed as you mostly were in duffel coats uh, and other scruffy gear. Indeed. But uh, as to why I chose uh, uh, legal life, well, in part it was because um, I once went to a Labor Party branch meeting and that was enough for me. Honestly. <laughs> I went to it, I, I, I was there, it was actually a most respectable branch because it was in Darling Point uh, and it was what is now called a Chardonnay set uh, Labor branch meeting, but I found it so ineffably boring, I, I could not imagine. Student politics was much more interesting and so I, I didn't think I could really uh, whip up a storm of interest about uh, real politics and secondly, um, I was at that time exploring my personal life in a way I'd postponed and therefore I came to the view, are you willing to be like Edward Heath was reputed to be, a gay man who was uh, keeping it all bottled up and the bottom line was I wasn't. I realised that love and life and friendship and companionship were very important to every human being. And so at that stage, and I think probably still now, I didn't think that there would be a future for me. So I got on with my work as a lawyer and ended up polishing up the handle of the big front door and here I am today. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to come back to your career as a lawyer. I want to make a couple. Of, first of all, I should explain for people who will not remember that Peter Walensky um, became an Australian diplomat, was I think, the chief advisor to Gough Whitlam during his prime ministership um, and died of cancer, I think something well over a decade ago, um, just to place him for those of you who don't know him. And also, Michael, just to remind people that someone, one of the women you talked about from that period uh, is someone who has had a long connection with this university and I hope will be resuming that connection, namely Professor Jenny Graves, who was uh, at that stage uh, one of the uh, Richard sisters from South Australia. Um, also, if I might just say, I shared with you, I think, that, that enormous dilemma of those of us who were gay in Australia in the latter part of last century, that one had to make choices, and it was very clear that certain avenues of public life would not be open if one's sexuality were known. Of course, we now live in a period where that has changed. We have Brian, um, Bob Brown and Penny Wong able to hold very high political office. The list isn't long. The list is not long. <laughs> and I can remember, actually, I had the same experience you did of going, I went to several ALP branch meetings, actually, in a number of inner city you suburbs. always were more persistent. <laughs> Yes, or some would say irritating. <laughs> but, but, but to revert to your legal career, um, which of course is, is, as Joe pointed out, extremely long and distinguished, and I don't know if this is a reasonable question to ask of a former judge. Looking back, what do you see as your greatest achievement in your role as a judge? Well, it's really for others to uh, judge that. And in fact, there is a biography coming out in a couple of weeks written by Professor A.J. Brown uh, of Griffith University, which um, snippets of which I've seen. He sees law and judges as political actors, not party political actors, but he sees the courts and the law as part of the governance of the country. And so he has a particular angle uh, on me and on the judiciary. As to my contributions, I think, first of all, um, I was very engaged with international perspectives of law. That hasn't been a tradition, especially in Australia and the United States of America. Both of those countries tend to be rather isolationist, but I had a sort of epiphany about how law could not remain outside the enormous expansion of our minds with the connection through the internet, through jumbo jets, through the world, and that therefore jurisdictionalism, which is the limiting factor of law, had to give way to global forces. So I think 
that was uh, a contribution, and of course it, it's still quite controversial, and some people don't agree with it at all. Um, but uh, there was that. I was also greatly influenced by a, a wonderful teacher of law at the University of Sydney, Julia Stone, who was a, a teacher in jurisprudence who taught that uh, law was not mechanical. Law was not simply an application of clear rules to a case that only yield one answer, but law was a matter of judges giving effect to values and that it was better that judges be open and discuss these values and it was be more transparent about them. So in a sense, I was a child of my teachers and especially of Julia Stone and this is the great gift that university teachers have. They don't get their dividend immediately. It doesn't come next decade. It comes a couple of decades down the track when they get into positions of responsibility. And so Julia Stone helped me. And I, I believe I tried to be open and to discuss the values that led me to particular conclusions. And thirdly, because my life was different from that of most judges, first of all uh, being gay, and but more important maybe, going to public schools. I was the only justice of the High Court of Australia for most of my service whose entire uh, education was at the public school system in New South Wales. It's an amazing thing that two thirds of the people of Australia go to public schools, but only one uh, was and is on the High Court at the moment. Justice Kiefel uh, has that, but all the others went to private schools. Now, that, I think, affects your values. If you grow up with uh, school children who have come to school bare f with bare feet, as they did in my, the North Strathfield Public School in Sydney just after the Second World War, then you do have a, tend to have a slightly different view. If you grow up in secular schools, you have a slightly different view. It's a, in a way a very Australian and democratic uh, environment and I'm very proud of my public school education and, and so these are factors that affected the way in which I uh, approached problems and they were slightly different, not very different in the big picture, they're not very different, but they were slightly different and, uh, and uh, I think that was a value added and I want to pick you up on, in fact, three of the, the, the themes that come through that, that comment, Michael. But firstly, um, I think it's true that in the United States there is much more of a tradition of judges of the Supreme Court being seen as public figures and being expected to speak as public figures. You stand out, I think, in Australia, for many of us who are lay people, who are not lawyers, as being a judge who was willing to speak on a range of issues. I'm curious how far that caused friction with more conservative members of the profession, whether you felt under pressure not to speak at times, uh, because in some ways I think your most important career publicly has been to use the position of a judge to help guide debate well, I was, I was very lucky in my life and I had a number of posts and I got to meet a very, very interesting people. I couldn't understand being in Canberra uh, as a Justice of the High Court with the, the marvellous flow of intellects. I mean, people coming to Canberra, uh, not political, but academic. In, I'm a university type person from the very beginning and therefore I would take advantage and get them to come to the court and get my colleagues to come to lunch with them and they all enjoyed it and you got ideas. I was interested in the ideas and Julia Stone had taught me that those ideas were inevitably going to affect my thinking and therefore I thought it was appropriate to engage.